Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another photo mishmash. This one being broadcast live November 17th, 2021. We're going to talk about food. I hope you've had a nice meal sometime recently because otherwise you're going to get really hungry. And if you're like me, you're going to get a little hangry during this show because we're going to be looking at some beautiful food photography from one of our guests, and that is Nicole Leverett. Nicole, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here and hang out with you guys. Yeah. Now, this is the first time Nicole has been on, so I'll tell her this, and I'll also tell the rest of you this if you haven't figured it out already. Really, I just stumble across people doing interesting things online and then use this show as an excuse to pick their brain a little bit. Like, how, how do they end up here photographing and making beautiful food photography? Or in case of Tanya, who is a reoccurring guest and a wonderful co-host on this show, how did she end up going viral on TikTok? We'll be talking about that lots lots more tanya how are you doing i'm doing great good. <laughs> so good yeah it's been a really weird week for me <laughs> yeah yeah so we're going to talk about that and also i mean the the truth that i was just i was just kind of uh rehashing this before the show i found nicole through TikTok. so all of you who think TikTok is just goofy teenagers out there well yeah there's a lot of that <laughs> But there's some really cool content on TikTok, and I certainly use it as, well, a procrastination tool, uh, primarily, let's be honest. Uh, but secondarily, I have stumbled across some people like Nicole creating really cool stuff. And then from there, went and found her on Instagram and then invited her onto the show. And she so graciously agreed. Uh, I want to say, um, oh, well, at first I should put up this. I'm a little rusty. I don't know why. If you'd like to follow Nicole, if you'd like to see these wonderful food photos and also the behind the scenes, and that was what really caught my eye, Nicole, when you were posting. Not only were you posting the images, but then you were showing how you were creating these images. Um, and it felt very uh, authentic and real and approachable in that you, you're not using tens of thousands of dollars worth of gear. Um, so I, I want to talk about that. I think that's very exciting. And I love when, you know, last week, no, sorry. Two weeks ago, we had a photographer that recently went to the Olympics. Was she using the latest gear for all of her shots? No, no. Um, and in some ways, that's kind of antithetical to what I do here and sharing reviews about gear and inviting people to like buy the next cool camera. But the reality is you really don't need that to make beautiful pictures. So, yeah, we'll talk about that. Uh, but you can follow Nicole at Stay and Focus Images on Instagram. Yeah. Um, and of course, uh, Tanya is uh, Tanya Wilhelm artist on Instagram as well. Uh, so, and I want to take a moment and say hi to the chat room. Is uh, you know, everybody who has joined us on this Wednesday afternoon live? You can of course ask questions. Uh, you can ask, do you want to know more about the secrets to going viral on TikTok? You can ask Tanya. <laughs> I will not um, answer on that. <laughs> Uh, if you want to know if, if Nikki started out, you know, photographing food with a cell phone, you can ask those questions and oh, we will be getting to them over the course of the show. Um, yeah. You know, so mostly when I travel, I do document my food often. But beyond that, I've only dabbled in food photography once. So again, I'm, I'm excited to hear some tips and tricks and all of that stuff. So Roy is in the chat room. He is collecting questions. If you just throw a Q in front of it, then he'll make sure we ask. As, as you know, if you've watched the show a lot, it's a pretty informal show. Sometimes if the question fits right for when we're talking, we'll just answer it. But otherwise, we'll get to them towards the end of the show where we also have to talk about some exciting stuff. We're going to get those food photography tips. We've got to talk about the new firmware updates coming from Canon. I feel like Canon has really changed their mindset as far as firmware updates go from the past to now in a much more positive way. So we'll be talking a little bit about that. Um, and also, I'm really curious to hear what is on Nicole and Tanya's kind of holiday deals wish list, if anything at all. So we'll be sharing all of that stuff uh, over the course of this show. And always, if you're watching this and you have it, it's nice to give it a quick thumbs up. I really appreciate that. And it's a nice way to thank all of us for our time. Okay. Nicole, I, I just been talking a whole lot. Nicole, I want to hear a little bit from you. You are, as I said, a fantastic food photographer. I'm going to pull up uh, your Instagram here and we're just going to scroll through some of the pages. Can you just give us a little bit of a, an overview about how did you get here? How did you become a fantastic food photographer? What 
Thank you so much. It was actually an accident. So I think the origin of my journey is not too different from other photographers. So you get a camera and you just start shooting everything, trying to figure this thing out. And I was taking pictures of bugs and landscapes and just any and everything, just trying to one, understand the camera because I had no idea what I was doing. When I got the camera, I read the manual from like front to back and I was like, I still have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> like, I don't understand this at all. And I went to a webinar, actually it was in-person workshop with Scott Kelby. I'm not sure if anyone oh, follows yeah. him, but he's amazing. Mm -hmm. He does a lot of architecture and landscape photography. And I was like, okay, that's it. I'm gonna do landscapes, I'm gonna do architecture. And I dabbled, but uh, then it started getting cold. And I was like, indoors, because it's, it's like five o'clock here on the East Coast and it's dark already. So it's like, okay, what am I gonna do? I have a full-time job. So I get home and I'm like, I have 30 minutes of daylight <laughs> to shoot. So I started uh, taking pictures of things inside. And then the pandemic happened and lockdown happened because I haven't been at this photography thing for a very long time. Um, 2019 is when I got my camera. So mm -hmm. then when the lockdown happened, I was like, okay, I have all this time on my hands and I'm still inside. So let's start taking pictures of what I have access to. So it was food and beverages. And I also have a graphic design background. So I was thinking of ways of how could I combine taking photos and also editing them and creating composites. So a lot of my work are composites, even if they don't look like composites, usually they're several layers deep of, of Photoshop work into the images. So I just really found like that was where I wanted to be. And then like, I had no idea like cocktail photography was such a huge like niche on Instagram. Like there's so many people doing amazing things with cocktails. And I kind of just found my way in there because my husband, he makes he makes cocktails. He doesn't drink a lot, but he's like, if I'm going to have a drink, it has to be a good one. So I'm like, mm -hmm. if you're making these drinks, I want to take that. photos of them. And I just felt like it was another way to like continue to challenge myself because I'm like, if we have to put out content every Monday, because we like to release a, a recipe every Monday, then that forces me to have to take a photo every week. So it was like a, a check for myself to make sure I was always continuing to improve so it's kind of like accidental but i feel like it's where i'm meant to be because i i truly love like the arranging the the styling the plating all of that that's one of my favorites this this is a, a lovely image i mean what captures my attention right away is the lighting here is just so good so as you said you you haven't been doing this for too long um, and as I, I kind of said, you're using a Canon 60 Mark II. Um, what lens and what, what light? So most often right now I'm shooting with my 100 millimeter macro. I just really love the compression. I just love how it just, it makes everything look. So I know I had that lens on, uh, for the light, I probably had my Godox 8200 with I think I probably had a strip box modifier on that, just looking mm -hmm. at the way the light is. I don't think it was mm -hmm. not filtered. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. I think I do have the behind the scenes on that one in uh, in reels, but that was okay. a single light kind of like coming from the back and it's a composite of each step. I poured, I had chopsticks holding the garnish and then I did a little zest with the other hand on the other side. Nicole, nice. I was on your Instagram uh, yesterday and today, actually, after Toby posted it, and I love your behind the scenes reels. Thank and you. And the quality of light in your food photography, and it just has this richness to it that I feel like I haven't seen, especially as consistent. Like you just have this consistency throughout all your work. And I'm also completely intrigued that these are composites because I would not have guessed that. Yeah, so I, I think the compositing comes from me being a perfectionist. So especially like when it comes to drinks, because we're using real things. We I don't like to use like the fake stuff that some sometimes happens in food photography. So I'm using mm -hmm. real ice and it melts. Yes. And sometimes the garnishes get real sad looking. So 
Um, if I'm doing two drinks, usually we're making them one at a time. So I'll get one and I'll just start snapping right away. So then when we get the second one in, if the first one is now looking sad, at least I have shots of it already. So then I can mix it with the shots of the second one. But um, when it comes to like the, the richness of it, I love that you mentioned that because it's something that I actually thought about because, you know, you're trying to find your own voice in photography in general and you you see what other people are doing. And it's like, I don't want to just, I don't want to look like everyone else. Like, I don't want to, like, maybe we all took the same course <laughs> on how to like something, but I don't want my stuff to look like everyone else's stuff. So I think I'm very intentional about colors and when I'm doing my color grading and Photoshop, like I want it to look the way it looked when we made it, but richer. So I, I tend to be very thoughtful about the color choices and, and any filters or anything that I apply on it when I'm, when I'm editing. But yeah, I love that you mentioned that. Well, it definitely shows throughout your work. And I do think I've seen a lot of food photography lately that it just seems like it's all high key and very, I, I don't know, it kind of all has the same vibe and yours just really has just depth in both the light and color and the composition. So thank you. It does. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how, how often are you using more than one light in these setups? Usually it's one light. Occasionally I'll dabble with two lights. So my main thing, like, well, I wouldn't say my main thing, but one of the things that I, I try to do when I'm using artificial light is mimic daylight. So this mm -hmm. one is artificial light and I wanted it to look like dappled light coming from the sun. So I had mm -hmm. like some leaves in front of the light to kind of make it look like it was outside. So mm -hmm. my goal is always to try and mimic the sun. So that's why I usually will do a single light, but there's, um, there's a drink. I think you might be getting to it. It was a black widow. Um, it was dark and moody. It was around the time when the movie came out. I don't remember. Oh, there it is in the middle with the, yep. So that one, I had two lights. I had one light on the right as like the key light. And then on the left, I had a light with the red gel on it on the snoot to give it more of like the red hue around it. So that was me playing around with two lights shooting in the basement. But yeah, usually it's one light. Nice. Yeah, it's, I, I love the simplicity of the shots, and you know the ones that look outdoors, they they look like outdoor light. That's just yeah. just fantastic. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And I also I like that you mentioned you know not using fake. Uh, you know, anytime I talk to people about food photography, everybody always shares the one one thing they've heard that like ice cream's actually mashed potatoes. I think that's less and less true these days, and I yeah. think a lot of people are trying for realism. Um, in their shots and and actually using the actual ingredients. I mean, these, you know, I I, I gave people warning that they're going to be hungry, but now I just want one of these really good cocktails. Um, <laughs> all of them look so good. I'm not a huge drinker or a big drinker, I should even say, but so many of these drinks just look absolutely delicious. Really, really good. I did like seeing, though, in your one reel, uh, you showed where you were staging, like, cups of, I don't know if it was, like, chili or soup, and you put like a bowl inside the bowl so you didn't have to mm -hmm. fill it up all the way. Yeah. And I love seeing things like that, like little tricks of. Mm -hmm. so yeah, that's a good fun. one. Not, a only, <laughs> not only does it um, help you like spread out your ingredients, it helps if you want to garnish things on top because it has a platform to sit on. So like when I put like, you know, nuts or croutons, it'll, it won't sink down to the bottom. So I love like things like that. So anytime you see a bowl of something, I usually have like a ramekin inside to like take up some of the space. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Uh, so uh, tiny has been mentioning reels. I'm just curious, you know, as somebody who is trying to grow their Instagram, I hear more and more about reels and the importance of reels uh, and Instagram's kind of emphasis on them. How have you found reels versus instagram and also let's throw TikTok in because we're going to talk to tanya in a minute about going viral in there uh how how has this helped your growth would you say um definitely instagram reels have been good to me mm -hmm. TikTok has been 
TikTok is weird. Like, I feel like I I get I get some views, but I I, I really feel like they're they're working against me to like not have people look at my stuff on TikTok. <laughs> but on Instagram, I post things, and I feel like people actually see it. People actually relate, and you know they comment. So Instagram reels definitely I will continue to do because you know I love giving people like the insight like I love sharing my process and you know having people see what I do because I think before when I was just sharing images people like oh that's nice but when you see what goes into creating it I feel like that gives you like I don't know maybe more to appreciate because it's it's not that simple of you know just throwing something on a table <laughs> snap the button so right yeah. right yep that is good um one of the things that strikes me about a lot of these uh pictures that we're seeing in, in video is the background is really cool looking i love you know you've got some of these nice kind of weathered wood looks and other really clean looks and i saw up here in your profile that you're a quirky ambassador mm -hmm. um so and i i checked that out so there are these kind of backgrounds how often are you using them and what can, what can you tell us a little bit more about them? Yeah, sure. So in general, I am a, a prop junkie. I have, mm -hmm. have an addiction to, to props and, and surfaces. So I love um, being able to change the look of a scene without like having to go buy a piece of furniture. So I use my dining room table a lot, but I specifically bought that dining room table just for food photography. Nobody eats there. It's just for me to take pictures. But I love having I love these quirky backdrops because you can easily change the look and feel. There's tile, there's wood, there's all these different types of surfaces. One of my favorites, it's like a cement look. Um, mm -hmm. I just I just love how easy it is. You can just, they're magnetic, they stick to a board and you can clip them together and you can switch them out however you need. So definitely, I love that they approached me to be an ambassador. They're a newer company and I just, I really love it. And, you know, it just makes everything so easy because I'm always looking for how can I change the look and stuff of, you know, the look and feel of my images because, you know, I'm shooting a lot of of the cocktails they're shot in my home so i'm like there's only so many ways i can shoot on my coffee table or in the kitchen or in the dining room so you know switching it up is it's so easy to do with these backdrops yeah nice cool so anybody who's interested more uh the link down below this show uh has nicole's little ambassador link in there so if you want to check out quirky um i'd invite you to do it in that way they do look great i i, I are they it's not fabric though. What is magnetic? It's kind of like a. Um, so there's a board. I would grab it if I could reach it. But there's a, a magnetic board. It's I have the square shape. They have two different shapes. I have the square shape, and then the actual backdrop is vinyl, and it has a magnetic okay. back to it. So they're they can roll up, so you can easily store them, and mm -hmm. you can roll them out, roll them onto the board, and they stay in place, and you're mm -hmm. good to go. Nice, nice, good. Um, you alluded to this, but I, I think it's just kind of important to, to share. Um, you have a day job, um, mm -hmm. which, which keeps you pretty busy. So you are creating these beautiful images and going to work during the day. Um, yeah. how, how do you balance that? Um, I don't sleep much. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually editing last night, um, as I posted earlier today, because um, it's National Baklava Day, if you didn't know. And a friend of mine gave me some yesterday. So I was like, well, I have to photograph it and edit it tonight because I want to post it tomorrow. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so during the day, I, I actually work as a data analyst. And part of my job as design lead for analytics is to make sure that our dashboards and our content looks beautiful. So we create these dashboards with very technical data, but you want to present it in a way. And one of the things I talk about is pre-attentive attributes. These are things that your brain processes very quickly, like bolded text, italics, things like that. And I feel like I bring some of that into my photography because I think like there are things that you can look at in an image and you just know right away that you like it. Like, mm -hmm. there's really no way to explain. It's like, that's a good image. I don't know why, I just like it. And I think that there are 
there are things like that in photography, like leading lines and, you know, rule of thirds and, you know, all those things that make up a good photo. You just know it when you see it. So I think about that when I'm, when I'm taking photos and even when I'm at work and I'm looking at dashboards of very technical numbers and things like that, I'm always thinking about creative ways of displaying stuff. So it's part of me. That's cool. What what strikes me is, uh, let's take this image, for example. You know, a lot of times in the show, a lot of folks who watch the show and are a part of our community, uh, I think, are primarily landscape photographers. Maybe a few more will become food photographers after watching this and after, you know, looking at this long, dark winter ahead of us. Um, but this, in our landscape, we're often kind of coaching to simplify, simplify, simplify. Like really strong images usually are strikingly simple. But then I look at something like this, there's so much going on in the image, but it still tells such, or it, it tells such a great story. I think it's um, a really neat kind of example at the other end of the spectrum of how, how well a busy image can work. Mm -hmm. I was actually thinking about this recently because I feel like there are, there are like two camps in food photography. There's like minimalist where it's very straightforward. Like it's the product, the food, no mm -hmm. props, very simple, straightforward. And then there's like maximalist where it's like all the things, like all the props, all the coasters, all the plates stacked up, all the, the plants and the branches and everything. And I feel like I, I, I lean towards maximalist, but like maybe more towards the middle. And I, I struggle because I love both. And I feel like there's a way to do the maximalist, but have it still tell the story when there's a clear subject. I think that's the key is... If there's a clear subject and you're directing the viewer where to look, I feel like that's when it works. But when like everything's in focus and it's colors everywhere, then I feel like, uh, I don't know where to look. So I think that's the difference of, and that's what I strive for, like when I'm doing something like this, because I don't always shoot with, you know, so many things going on in the background, but I feel like if I can make sure that, okay, the drink is the star, can we make sure that that's what comes through. I think that's when it works. Yep. Yep. I agree. I think that's well said. Nice. Uh, we have a question uh, in the chat that I think is useful. Do you only use one lens? A uh, two-part question. And and how much cropping do you do in the kind of final images? So for the lenses, I actually just sold a couple because I realized I wasn't using them. But primarily, I'm using a 50 millimeter and my 100 millimeter mm -hmm. uh, macro lens for food photography. But I also have a 35 millimeter and I have um, I have another one that I don't really use. It's like, I was taking pictures of the moon. So it's like 500 millimeters. I'm like, I don't really use it for anything else. But um, I, I really like prime lenses for, for what I do. Cause I feel like I'm able to get a super sharp image like I'm, I'm obsessed with things being in focus and being sharp so i like having a prime lens but i think um skipping ahead to the wish list i might get a zoom lens um yeah. in the near future but those are the lenses i primarily use and the second part of the question can you remind me what that was uh, how, how much cropping do you do from the original image so for cropping um typically when I, when i know i'm gonna post it on instagram i make sure that i take a portrait shot of it because i know instagram likes that four or five ratio so mm -hmm. i try to um, take a portrait and then i'm just cropping it to get it to four or five so i'm trying to make sure that i'm getting what i want in in the picture and I love to crop it so like, there's things like in this image, there's things cut off because I like to give the illusion that there's more going on. Mm -hmm. Really, in real life, on the other side, it was just chaos of like mm -hmm. ingredients spread out over the table. But I like to give the illusion that there's there's more going on beyond the frame. So I don't crop a, a whole lot, um, but I'm mindful of when I'm shooting, what I'm shooting for. Am I going to post it on my website? If I am, then I prefer a landscape version of the shot. So um, in the carousel, I try to include um, the split of a landscape. So if you click next on this, I think it will go to another version. So yeah, that one, it's gonna, if you're on yeah. Instagram, it'll slide 
and you can see yeah. the the landscape version of it. So I'm just mindful of where the image is going, and that's mm -hmm. how I determine how I'm going to shoot it and how I'll crop it. Nice, nice. It's cool. Um, what's your what's your goal here? Where would you like to be in a couple of years? Have you thought about that? Yeah, I have been thinking about that a lot lately because I feel like the the success that I've had to date has not been super intentional. It's kind of been accidental because I kind of stumbled into photography and I just started posting about it and people mm -hmm. wanted to hire me. And I'm like, really? <laughs> so, you know, it's been great, but I'm like, I want to like put some effort into it now and like really be intentional about the clients that I work with and what I do from here. So I'm actually, I'm working on a few things. One thing that I'll, I'll mention now, I'm actually working on launching a course just to teach some of the things that I've been doing and the things that I've been sharing in my reels, because I do get the questions in the DMs. And I also, um, sometimes I moderate a room on Clubhouse and mm -hmm. share my tips there. So it's like, I'm, I'm always giving out this information and people find value in it. So I'm like, I should package it and, you know, put it out sure. there. So definitely yeah. working on that. Awesome. I actually was just going to ask you, like, do you shoot and then uh, try to find a home for your images or are you mostly commissioned? Yeah. So um, on my Instagram, a lot of that is personal work because like if I shoot for someone, I let them, you know, post it on their site first or use it first before I go and, and share it. So, but a lot of it has been word of mouth. So a lot of chefs have reached out to me, folks that are either they're caterers or they're opening a business. Um, they'll reach out to me for images for their website, for like Grubhub and DoorDash and things like that. So it's been really great, like meeting people, like meeting chefs. They always send me home with food. So that's like <laughs> amazing. <laughs> like that's the best right there. Like I had no idea. I'm like, I've yeah. worked with bakeries. I've gone home with like stacks of cupcakes. I'm like, this is amazing. <laughs> Good choice. I was wondering that's in that last picture, like, that food looked amazing and it was getting cold. That's what I thought. <laughs> like, quick some of the things I cook. So like some of the things on Instagram, I cook and I'll style and plate. So I feel bad for my family because sometimes they have to wait for me to get all the shots before they can eat. So I think they're used to having cold food. <laughs> it's, it's for a good cause. Yeah. Uh, Nicole, I didn't, I didn't ask this. Um, where, where are you located? I'm in New Jersey. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I just, you know, I just, again, as I said, I love being able to do this show and connect with people that are doing interesting things. And I think about what a visual world we're in, how much DoorDash, Uber Eats has exploded mm -hmm. over the last year, 18 months, and then the need for good food photos. And so yeah. there's just so many cool opportunities out there. Very neat. Uh, uh, Chris, Christina, uh, Chris, Chris had a question. What aperture do you usually get enough depth of field? That's a good question. So it, it kind of depends, but sometimes I find myself around 3.24. Mm -hmm. um, I don't like to shoot like super wide open be, just because when I'm editing, I don't like the, the chromatic abrasion. Like usually mm -hmm. there's always like a purple or green hue that happens. So um, because I'm shooting with artificial light, a lot of times I don't need to drop it all the way down. Mm -hmm. But yeah, usually around like 3.2 is like been the sweet spot for me. Like sometimes I'm not even aware of it and I look and I'm like, oh, I'm still at the same <laughs> the same spot where I was before. And it just, you know, it really works out for cocktail photography to get the, the drink and the garnish in focus without like there being a, cause I don't want to have to like do tons of editing after everything. So I do try to get it right in camera first. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. As I said, now I want, I'm just, I'm drinking almost cold tea. So it just feels really cruel <laughs> looking at all of these and uh, yeah, just drinking cold tea. That's awesome. All right, uh, Tanya, let's, before we start reviewing images, we teased this at the beginning of the show. Uh, for those who are watching and don't know, I think most of you know Tanya, a uh, pen member, uh, frequent contributor, very, very artistic. Uh, you do images that you really, nobody else in the group does um, and that we all love. Um, but you're also outside of those creative images you are creating while well, you're furniture flipping um, and you are decorating your house for the holidays, which, yeah, I mean, sure, a lot of people are, but you documented it and then that went viral. Well, tell us a little bit about um, your experience over the last 36 hours. First, well, 
T tell everybody how many views the video has. Go ahead and just share that. Well, when I checked before the show, I was at 1.6 million. Yeah, 1.6 million. So we're not talking like 10,000 views, 30,000 views. We're talking 1.6 million. Now, I think some of you watching are probably like, there's 1.6 million people on TikTok. Yeah, TikTok is big. I mean, I see some of these it videos. It's so fast. It yeah. was, yesterday, I would refresh and there would be another thousand. And I'd refresh and there'd be another thousand. It was so crazy. It was the craziest thing I've ever seen. Like, I've worked social media hard. I mean, I'm not, I wasn't working TikTok. Actually, I joined TikTok, well, kind of because Toby egged me into it, but <laughs> I, started, I started using the editing platform and I liked that better to add to my reels. So really mm -hmm. I was making TikToks to transfer them into reels on Instagram because I like Instagram better as a platform. Um, so I had, two days ago, 45 followers on TikTok. And like, I think maybe once I had a video that had like 2000 views and I was excited about that. <laughs> so yesterday was so bizarre. I mean, just having like the video has over a hundred thousand likes. I've never experienced anything like that in my life. And so I should probably explain, um, I, make a lot of things out of recycled trash. And that is what blew up. Um, I've been doing like set design for our, our church VBS. I go to really great lengths and almost everything is foam and paper and plastic. And so all of my porch decorations are trash <laughs> and zip ties. That is what I made my porch out of. Um, and apparently, it's funny because I actually posted a couple of videos showing how I was making everything. And then the one that went viral, I was kind of making fun of myself because it's just silly that I do it. And that's the one that went crazy. <laughs> So. It's got it's great. You picked great music for it too, which I think really helps. I think that might be a key. <laughs> that was key, and it's the most. It's not Christmassy at all. Essentially, it was like. What is wrong with me? That's what the song says. <laughs> well, uh, nothing. Nothing's wrong with you. Uh, <laughs> I think you're a very clever individual, and you crack the Insta or the the uh, TikTok algorithm clearly. Um, I it's mean, just, it's be interesting to see. Really. Like yesterday, people were like, "Are you going to capitalize on this? What are you posting today?" And I was like, "Nothing." <laughs> <laughs> no, I have no plan for this. <laughs> I did not expect this to happen. Um, Although I was thinking about, uh, it's kind of trickling down into some of my, like the top nine all are getting a lot of views. Um, mm -hmm. Like I had a couple that, well, I can't even, I can't see it on your screen, but I had a couple that, like, I think I had one that went over a hundred thousand. Um, yeah, that, what, that one's almost 160,000 and the one next to it set 70,000. Yeah. And I went from 45 followers to like, what am I at 1500? Yeah, 1578. Okay. Wow. In 24 yeah. hours, like it was so strange. Mm -hmm. it just It's almost annoying because I like to watch TikTok in the evening and the notifications were like, I was kind of getting irritated. <laughs> Poor you. <laughs> Poor you for finding success I've on Instagram. I've never had TikTok. this problem. <laughs> so yeah. it's just, it, you know, it, it played into like 40 Instagram followers, which was surprising, but um, I don't know. It, yeah. it was really fascinating kind of seeing how that one video getting that many views turned into different like conversions mm -hmm. like in followers that's, that's, uh, and that's uh, what i'm really curious about i love i love that you went viral and i loved kind of seeing how what what the reality is as it plays out yeah so it will be interesting i kind of wondered if i should like maybe repost some of the old um behind mm -hmm. the scenes of my photography and see what happens with that or if TikTok will like know that i'm regurgitating mm -hmm. No, I think you can. I, I feel like a lot of people do that. They repost stuff all the time because I feel like TikTok is not like in any type of chronological order, the way they present yeah. videos. I feel like you could, they'll send you a video from like eight weeks ago and you're like, oh, I never saw this before. So <laughs> I say repost. Okay. Well, I might try that um, just because I'm not planning on creating a whole lot of, well, I do kind of have a new project I'm working on, but 
We'll see. <laughs> Uh, let me let me ask e either of you that can answer this. Um, I whenever I've posted very little to TikTok, um, I've posted a couple of things. Uh, it, I get yelled at by TikTok all the time for saying this video is too high a quality. It doesn't accept higher than 1080. So, what do you do? You have you do you have that issue? I don't have that problem. I have only created TikToks from cell phone footage, yeah. Yeah, and then with the exception of sometimes I'll post like I'll I post like a final image. But mm. that's a still. Mm. So I've never used good quality. Mm. I need to explore more. Yeah. I don't know. So for my cocktail videos, I shoot the, the process of making the cocktail. I shoot that on a DSLR. But I'm editing it for web on my phone. So I'll have like the, the version of the video for my laptop to put on mm. my website, which is basically straight out of the DSLR and edit it in like Adobe Premiere or wherever I edit it. But the version that I put online, I'm putting through Splice or CapCut. So I think that compresses it. Mm -hmm. So then I don't have issues when I'm putting it. Gotcha. Okay. So I think you got to play around with maybe just popping it into like Splice and exporting it back out. And maybe that will. Cool. Thanks. I'll take a look. Cause that's, yeah, that's what I figured. Um, but uh, I hadn't explored further yet. All right. I will say this, I work at my kid's school and my son is in sixth grade and I was so popular with the junior high boys today. <laughs> <laughs> They're all like whispering every time I walk by. It was very funny. <laughs> she went viral. I know. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. <laughs> so important to kids. It's, it's hilarious. It's cool. <laughs> yep. Yeah, no, it is. The many uh, a couple of summers ago, my kid was at camp, and he was uh, my son was at camp, and he was talking to the other kids about what they do, and he's like, "My dad's a YouTuber," and they're like, "Whoa, really?" And I was like, "Well, what do the other parents do?" He's like, "Well, this one mom, she's a doctor working on cancer cures." I'm like, "Okay, <laughs> I got the whoa cool, but you got a mom over here that's literally curing cancer. Let's right. let's let's figure out what's more valuable to society." Um, but it was pretty funny. Yeah, it's just kind of it's where we are. I know okay. some were like, are you TikTok famous? And I was like, no, I only now have a respectable following. That's all. <laughs> it's only going to grow. Yeah. It's only going to grow. <laughs> um, all right. Um, let's dive into uh, the show where the part of the show where we review images. And as I said, it's beginning. Um, Oh, actually, I said this off camera. We're going to try to get through as many as we can. So we're going to kind of keep our feedback um, on the briefer side, uh, just so we really I feel like we've been a little bit behind lately. I love I love being able to give feedback. It's one of um, kind of the coolest parts of the show and also of the pen community and uh, as a way to grow as a photographer, getting regular feedback from other professionals, um, you know, gives you a sense of what to look for when you're out in the field composing or creating these compositions. Um, and of course, when you're editing, which is an important part of the whole process. So let's jump in. Um, and let's, I do want you to follow Tanya, but I'll take that banner away now. Okay. First up, we've got Sue Stevens cacti flower. And now uh, I'll just say this. I know uh, Nicole and Tanya, you were seeing a little bit of a lower res quality. So sometimes I might bring up something that you might not actually even be able to see because you're basically on the other end of this. Um, the I first thing I think about, what, go ahead, yeah, Tanya. Can I ask you about this? Is For me, it doesn't look like that whole front rim of the petals are, are sharp. Am I correct in that? Y yes, it is okay. just out of focus. And, and it, it kind of brings back to the question um, that uh, Chris asked of Nicole, of like, what what apertures, you know, are you using um, to, to get the shot and make sure everything's in focus? This was shot at f5.6, 43 millimeters on a crop sensor camera. And I think, or no, I'm not going to say, Sue, I wish it was shot with a little bit more depth of field. Yeah. Um, because we've had these cool spikes in the foreground and most of them are in focus, but then we get to the flower, which is in a lot of ways, kind of the main part of the story. And it's already starting to fall a little out of focus. Well, and I'm sure Nicole can speak to this as well, but when you're shooting macro, how far away you are from your subject really influences your aperture and depth of field. So in a case like this, you could shoot 
at a smaller f-stop number if you have more distance between mm -hmm. you and the subject as well. Yep, I agree. And I, I really wish the flower was in complete focus because I feel like that would have, that would have, I would prefer if the flower was in focus and maybe the spikes in the front were blurry. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. I think composition wise, Sue, it's, it's lovely. I love the colors. I love that green in the background that kind of contrasts to that soft, I'm not even sure what color to call that, a little bit of purple, a little bit of violet of the flower mm -hmm. in the foreground. But um, yeah, I agree. I agree. Nice. All right. We are so lucky to have a food photo from Chris. So Nicole, I'm just going to completely turn it over to you. <laughs> yeah, sure. So one of the things that I, I love to do when shooting food is to play in the shadow. So while I, I like this image, I think I would have loved to see just a little more shadow to create interest because I feel like it's all totally lit. But I feel mm -hmm. like when you include more shadows, like maybe on the left side of the image, like if the light's coming from the right, and mm -hmm. dropping off, then I feel like it could just be that more dynamic. But I, I do like the shot um, and I probably would, would crop it as well. So the subject is not dead in the center. Yeah, what uh, what would you suggest? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a fan of the rule of thirds. So I tend to like always move things over, over to one side, something like that, I think. Yeah, yeah. Close. And I love, I just threw, you know, again, as we have said many times on this, this show, um, that some of our edits are things that we would wish you had done in the field, but we're just kind of trying to recreate mm -hmm. that effect, um, both cropping and also lighting. So I threw a, a graduated gradient across the bottom here to just darken it a little bit more and bring that um, uh, kind of, you know, make the shadows just a little bit more prominent there um, and not as even. These look like homemade bagels, Chris, and they look uh, delicious. Yeah, they do. Yeah, and uh, to take you know to take some other lessons from some of your shots, Nicole. I, I love you know the examples we looked at that had a lot of other things going on. So like you know a nice little bowl of cream cheese, a, a, mm -hmm. a knife ready for that. Um, maybe one of these even already toasted. Um, you know, mm -hmm. in the process of of being cream cheesed would be cool. <laughs> Okay. Thanks, Chris. Heather's got this shot. So it might be hard for Nicole and Tanya for you to see, but um, there is a fence across the bottom. And once I see that fence, it's really hard to unsee it. And it comes up. It does. Why can I zoom here? It, it comes up enough to just, let's say done to just cross, mm. oh, actually it's another fence on the other side. There's two there, There's two fences on either side of this highway. Um, and that, it bothers me. Uh, I love, what I love about this image is these straight trunks and these white, probably birch, uh, that are just getting hit by the sun and being lit. They're very nice, but I don't wanna see the fence. And then I'm, we're a little too close. Maybe instead of cropping it, maybe like clone it out with yeah. trees from from above. Oh yeah, maybe bring some of this into the foreground and mm -hmm. hide it. Just cover it yeah. up. Yeah, yeah, that's certainly an idea. Um, ideally, and Heather, I know you've been on trips with us. I wouldn't call you super tall, but ideally, <laughs> if you could get up above this fence um, in the future, uh, that would be. That would be something to do. I'm also curious. I know this is a fall color shot, but what happens when we go black and white? Hmm. Hmm. Eh, maybe not. I also think that's a lot of sky in this image. Yeah. Like this might be a good panoramic. To really pull down and get narrow. I'm gonna go back to color because I with don't like the black and white. Yeah, I like the the blue and yellow i mean we're getting close to complementary colors there so mm -hmm. i think that works for this but yeah it's just unfortunate because that fence would be really tedious to photoshop out and you also have even if you decided like oh i don't really mind that the fence that's closest to the tree line 
you have some of the foreground kind of like some of those plants you would definitely need to work on that kind of like go into the secondary line horizontal line there and mm -hmm. so if you'd want to keep this there's a lot of work involved i think but yeah you know beautiful yeah. colors great sky yeah agreed all right uh brian has a shot and he called it at first i saw the title trendsetter and i thought he was calling himself a trendsetter and i was like well, that's a little brian um uh, but <laughs> i'm pretty sure it refers to this tree peeking out here that's kind of the colors and then we have some others back up here this looks like a painting yeah i love it, it it does. I, I, there's a lot to love here. It feels like it's been given what, what the, the Orton effect, where I don't know, Nicole, if you've ever used that in any kind of food photography or came across that while you're dabbling in landscape. It's where you give a little bit of blur to an image and kind of gives it a little bit sense of, of a foggier or a misty kind of day. Um, Got it. Yeah, I've not dabbled in that, but I really love what's happening in the sky. And I love the reflection and the, the rippling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's very nice. I, I almost wonder, uh, let's hit R and see if there's a crop here at all. Yeah, I, I think there's, there's a lot of intentionality that I think makes this a very strong image. For instance, you are clearly including the tops of some of these taller trees over here on the left and not cropping them out. Um, which I think is important. And I love the way these greens kind of reach up into that brighter area. But I, I wonder almost what something like this uh, would be if you could come down a little bit more into the reflection and let just the reflection tell the story. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's another opportunity there. You have any thoughts about this one, Tanya? I really love the effect that he has on this that gives it that painterly feel. It because it's so intentional, I just think it works really well. Mm -hmm. And um, I do wish maybe there was just a little more of the reflection colors. Mm -hmm. um, but if you don't have that in the, orig the original image, you could actually uh, copy the water and like transform and pull those, like stretch them up a little bit if you That's wanted true. a little more. That's true. Yep. You know? A little Photoshop action. But nice. But you don't want to pull away from that one bright red either. So this, mm -hmm. this could stay just the way it is and I'd be happy. Yeah, yeah. I think it could be a pretty minimalistic shot too here with, you know, one of the other things that I want to point out that I love is just a couple of rocks that mm -hmm. seem to frame this area underneath this. And so finding that spot where that composition works there, Brian, I think you, you did a really nice job. Yeah, good. All right, uh, Roger Hunt, has submitted to I we've seen some others of Rogers. I have we have we looked at this one, Tanya? Does this ring any bells? No, we didn't. He had them in the okay. pen forum, but not here. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. So I think first question, and I'd love chat room to chime in on this too, um, is what do you think black and white or color? Which works better in your opinion? I love both. So strong. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Both both are great. I remember looking at something similar to this in the past, and I think most people jumped and said color. Um, well, the other rendition, he had that really dramatic one where it was splashing, and that one for me was 100% color, but mm -hmm. I almost just a little bit favor the black and white on this one. Mm -hmm. uh, can, you, can you say why? Well, man, the, the color tones in the color version are so perfect that it's hard, but I just fe feel like he has the perfect amount of contrast in this black and white. Mm -hmm. um, and man, and everything, I love this shot. I just don't, yeah. but that's how I feel about most of his photos. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Roger is an excellent bird photographer. I am leaning a little towards the black and white as well, I think, because it feels a bit more balanced. The that, that bright yellow bill kind of dominates for me in the color version. It keeps pulling my eye to it. So. Okay, well, now that you said that, I'm, I feel very strongly about the black and white because I agree with that. 
chat room. We've got a black and white. We've got a color. We've got a color. We've got a color. We've got a color. A black and white. Um, the color, color. It looks like color is is winning, but not by a massive margin. It's it's fairly close. No, chat room, you're all wrong. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, as you as you have you watch us uh, kind of struggle to articulate here. I think both are both are excellent, but I lean a little towards black and white. Well, and he sells right. his images, so you know if you feel that strongly about color, you should purchase it in color. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Nicole, I imagine you don't do a lot of black and white for food photography. It's interesting. I actually um, challenged myself a few weeks ago and I actually converted a bunch of images to black and white because, like you said, it's not very common in food photography because, yeah. you know, the goal is to make things like, you know, oh, I want to eat that. I want to drink it. So you need to be able to see the color and see the texture. So I, I took some of the drip and drop shots that I've got from like pouring um, from a jigger into a glass or from a muddler, like images like that, I think where it's like in process of like making a drink or making a dish. I think those work really well in black and white, but sometimes like the, the ooey gooeyness of an image that needs mm -hmm. to be in color. Mm -hmm. Nice. Good. All right. Uh, we're going to skip up to uh, Mike. He, he submitted two. Um, he personally, well, actually, I'm not going to say which one he likes best. Um, Nicole, you have any thoughts on these two images from Route 66? So I really like the image on the left because I love the light trails. Um, mm -hmm. I assume it's like a car or a few cars passing by. I, I love long exposure. So I really like that. I like the colors. I kind of just wish there was little more going on maybe but mm -hmm. in general i like it just because of the light trails i just i'm really a fan of long exposure mm -hmm. yeah tanya what are your thoughts uh can i see the long exposure on its own real quick yeah i love them both because they tell different stories um one of the things i i really like about the close-up um is that it has the great diagonal. And I, I really like the detail of like the neon in the number, which I feel like maybe you could fix in the in the uh, wide shot a little bit. Like maybe just pull down the highlights because mm -hmm. it's there. And then I also like this one, but I would just take out maybe a few of the distracting, like there are a couple of lights in the background that kind of pull away like maybe your cursor is really close to the one highlight yeah. yeah i feel like that one kind of i keep going back up to that and i really want to go from the 66 sign to that traffic light you know in the distance and that one mm -hmm. kind of catches me but it's it's tough because they're completely different shots if i had to pick i'd probably go with the close-up but just because i love the detail in the lights yeah uh, I'm going to be the tiebreaker, uh, not that this is a competition. I, I like this because it's, it gives me a sense of, of place and scale and the dynamic uh, of the, the cars going through and underneath this. Um, it's a little messy. You know, got this, this, this side really kind of brings you out of the high feel of Route 66. Uh, but at the same time, it, it tells the story of, you know, kind of modernism of this the the exposure on the right one i think spot on mike um but it's really hard to what size is this you know where is it in the world if i saw this just by itself i think i would think that's nice and colorful but it wouldn't hold my attention for too much longer because i don't know if it's the real sign or if it's a toy sign or you know what the context is there oh if you keep the wide shot you should um Copy and flip and paste that neon. That <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. It is getting it's getting quite hot up there in that sixty six and over here, Mike. This exposure is just spot on. Really, really nicely done. Well, well, I was talking about the red bottom edge on the very left of the sign. Looks like it it burned out. Oh, I see what you're oh. saying. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. Yep. That's funny. 
Okay, we got one more I want to hit uh, before we finish up this review, and this is Becky's uh, from our trip uh, what, two weeks ago to uh, to Italy. And my first thought when I saw this was like, oh, that's kind of unfortunate placement. And then I thought, oh, she meant to do this. That's kind of neat. If you can't tell, you're probably you both are smarter than I am. I'll, I admit <laughs> that, even though Nicole, I've only talked to you for about a, uh, an hour now, um, is that she very nicely lined up the rising sun with this lamp post. Mm -hmm. It's cool. Nice, Becky. I like it. I like it. The only thing that I would uh, suggest is that uh, you wait a little bit for this ugly fairy to kind of move on out of the way. Um, it's, it's not a deal breaker, but because your depth of field was pretty high because you're creating a starburst, um, you know, that's all in focus back there. And so it gets kind of a level of importance. And Nicole, you were talking about this with your food photography. You know, you have these busy images, but you're very carefully controlling your depth of field to make sure that those background elements aren't stealing the show. Um, I, I, I don't know. Am I being too picky here? I mean, I didn't notice it until you pointed it out. So. <laughs> okay. It is I mean, there's very fortunate that it's like right there along that town. So it kind of blends in a little, but mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. you aren't wrong about it'd be fantastic if it wasn't there, but I didn't notice it to begin with. So, okay. That could be being a little too picky, but I also know Becky that if you had waited, you know that the sun's not rising too fast, things aren't changing too fast, that uh, that bigger boat would have been out of there. And I had given a little speech about street photography and waiting for those kind of good intersections at the beginning of this trip. So I don't know if you were paying attention, Becky, um, but I just uh, love you know I I love that kind of after I realized what you did here, I love that little. Uh, moment of it. That's cool. Okay. Uh, we're going to come back to us. So I just give you warning back on screen. Thanks everybody who submitted images. If uh, we didn't get to yours, we'll get to them as soon as possible. Uh, thank you for sending them in. If you're watching the show and you'd like to submit images for the future, well, please, you can do that. The link is posted every week, a day prior. And then in the show notes, it is also posted. If you're a pen member, if you're not a pen member, you should should consider joining. It's just $24 for your first year. And it is a fantastic community of people. Um, and I just love the, the the questions and answers that people get and, and uh, sharing all of the different content that we do through pen. So photorec.tv slash pen is the best way to take advantage of that uh, first year discount. Okay. I actually had somebody message me some questions after the show last week. And uh, I really just told them, what an important investment pen would be considering their questions. And I just can't speak highly enough about being part of that group. Like there's content on absolutely everything photography related. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah sometimes I feel a little like a jerk because people write me and I answer. And then if they continue to write me lots and lots and I'm answering, uh, you know, gear recommendations or discussions about what ISO is, is best depending on the situation, um, you know, at some point I'm like, Hey, you should join pen. And then they ignore that and they continue to write me. I mean, this is how I've chosen to make my living. And I think that, you know, if you called a plumber and we're like asking them for free advice again and again, or Nicole, you said you've been asked and people have been in, you know, the direct messages of Instagram saying, how do you do this? Yeah. You should put together and charge for it because you, we have a skill set. This is how we've chosen to make a living. And it's totally fair. But it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to kind of at what point do I, you know, feel like a jerk in saying, hey, you know, this is my life. I don't know. I don't have I never feel like a jerk for telling people about pen because it's there's more value than you're going to ever put into it monetarily. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, Tim's mm -hmm. perfect. Yeah. So, I didn't even pay him to say that. <laughs> and I. I will answer as like the questions I was being asked were pretty specific to some of the things in my business and what I talk about. So, you know, that's, that makes a lot of sense to ask those kind of personally, but yeah, when it comes to like gear and using different software and basic photography questions, like it's all there, it's all available plus the community. And uh, so yeah, absolutely worth it. All right. 
All right, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, just some quick news bits. Uh, actually, just one news bit, and then we're going to talk about our holiday wish lists and wrap the show up with some questions and answers. Um, Canon has coming. The, this is rumored, um, but it feels pretty real. Uh, vehicle autofocus will be coming to the R5 and R6 in a December firmware update. Now, if you remember, the R3 has been announced and is starting to trickle out. It's been in the hands of reviewers. And one of the kind of big headline features of that was uh, uh, car autofocus, uh, being able to lock on to track cars uh, and being able to actually even lock on to the helmets or the drivers in those cars to make sure that focus was where you want. Uh, that sounds like a very flagship level kind of advance, but here now Canon saying we're going to put that in the R5 and R6 as well. Um, it, I, I led into the show with Canon kind of flipping this because for so many years, with a few exceptions, Canon has been very stingy with firmware updates. They basically are bug fixes and that's about it. But now that we're kind of into this mirrorless world, I feel like Canon has been doing a good job. Um, new video codec and firmware improvements for, uh, sorry, on the video side of things for the R6 and R5 have already been released. And now this autofocus update as well. It's, I just want to say kudos. I'm, I'm very happy to see it. Uh, Nicole, you are shooting with a, a DSLR, the 60 Mark II. Uh, you tempted by mirrorless? Yeah, I've been tempted. So I, I started with an SL2 as a crop sensor. I sold mm -hmm. that. I got the 60 Mark II. I rented a couple cameras just to see like what I liked best. Like everybody has a 5D Mark II or Mark IV. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I didn't like it. I don't know. I'm like, everybody shoots with it. I don't like it. So I, I really like the 60 Mark II. I like the articulating um, LCD screen because if I'm doing like all the special effects myself, I can flip it around and like see what I'm doing. So mm -hmm. I really liked it for that reason. And then I thought like, you know, should I invest in mirrorless? Cause everybody's going towards mirrorless. So I think what I'm going to do in the new year is rent it and mm -hmm. like feel it out and see what I like about it. See what I don't like. Cause now I have, I also have a, a 90D, I think that's also a crop mm -hmm. sensor, but I use that mainly for video because I can do like the super slow-mo shots or like mm -hmm. pouring and things like that. So it's like, I have two cameras, like if I'm shooting, like I don't shoot people often, but when I do, I like to bring both cameras so I can put two different lenses on there. I'm like, do I really need a third? I don't know. <laughs> it's a slippery slope. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is a slippery slope, um, you know, and I think the 60 Mark II is, it's, it's getting a little old um, and that sensor wasn't brand new when they used it in the 60 Mark II, but your work is a clear example of, so what? You, it, I, I, I look at your images and you may or may not want to hear this, but I look at your images and I don't think you need anything newer, you know, other than it's, it's kind of fun to have the new thing and the shiny yeah. thing. You know? So it's just, it's just, it's just nice to, to talk to people who are making cool images and cool content without the very latest thing. So. Yeah, thank you. I, I firmly believe that the best camera is the one that you have. So if it's a mm -hmm. cell phone or if it's, you know, some crop sensor, because I was doing composite images with the crop sensor and I just, I felt like I, I wanted more out of my camera. So that's why I upgraded, but it wasn't because it, I wasn't able to use it. Or I wasn't able to, to capture what I wanted. I just wanted to do more, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice. Um, and, you know, and firmware update wise, uh, you know, again, Canon has done a really nice job here and, and uh, traditionally that, that hasn't been the thing, but Nikon as well. Fuji has been kind of the leader in firmware updates for so many years and they continue to be so. Sony, I feel like Sony was great for so long and now they've started to slip. There are so many things as a Sony shooter and maybe it's, I'm being a little harder on them because that's the camera I have at my hand most days, but there are just little changes that they could make or that they uh, should make in older cameras that I think would just really improve a lot of people's lives, but they haven't. So whatever. Okay. Let's talk fun. Holiday season is upon us. Deals are already here. It seems like deals every year, they've been a little bit earlier, but this year, I think manufacturers especially are saying, Hey, product is going to be very limited. Let's start these deals now um, to try to get people 
to, to buy, why we have stuff on the shelves. Uh, Nicole, you alluded to this. Um, you're thinking about picking up a zoom lens. Do you, or you want to be a little, any more specific than that? Do you have your eye on a specific lens or are you thinking about a certain range during this holiday season and anything else on your list? Yeah. So, um, not super specific, but I just think there are instances where I don't want to be switching lenses. It would just be easier for me to twist it. So maybe like the 24 to 70 range somewhere in there because 50 millimeter is really great for food photography mm -hmm. so as long as i can get that and maybe zoom in a little more and then i have the macro if i need to get a little closer or i want to you know get you know better depth of field i could use that but so mm -hmm. it's something i'm thinking about but I'm, I'm not i feel like i've been doing great without it so i'm like i don't know but there then there's certain situations where i'm like you know I'm screwing a lens and popping on another. I'm like, yeah, maybe I should. <laughs> I should yeah. I just, yeah, you can't go wrong with that 24 to 70 focal length. It's just, mm -hmm. and the Canon, you know, 24 to 70 L is just a great lens. Very, mm -hmm. very good lens. Yeah. Anything else besides that lens on your list that you hope to pick up? Yeah. So one other thing I've been thinking about, so I don't, when I'm shooting, I don't usually shoot tethered. Um, I've tried it and it just, I don't know. It's not my thing. Um, I prefer if it's going to my iPad, maybe I could see it because like if I'm shooting for a client, then I can easily show them the iPad to, mm -hmm. hey, do you like this? Um, but I don't like lugging around my laptop. So what I have been looking at are um, field LCD screens. So maybe yeah. getting like a smaller but larger than my LCD screen and propping that up on a stand. So like when I'm doing like my behind the scenes for like the course that I'm working on, I could easily show like this is what we're doing because I have a larger screen. So that's the other yeah. thing on the list. Yeah. I have um, on some of our international trips, I have brought those to help me do video, the Ninja. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, they're fantastic. Really, really nice external screen. Yeah. Cool. Um, Tanya, what are you hoping to pick up or not this uh, <laughs> holiday season? Well, between Apple and Nikon, I could list a lot of things, but that doesn't mean it will happen. <laughs> um, I am planning on getting one of the new MacBook Pros in January because my laptop is just so old. And uh, I mean, I would love the new Nikon mirrorless. But um, another thing that I, well, Nikon's already putting out deals on lenses, especially for yeah. the mirrorless. And I really was not planning on purchasing any lenses, but I am so hard on my 70 to 200 and I'm using the conversion ring for that, that mm -hmm. I have looked at that a few more times than I should have. <laughs> so yeah. like I, I have the grip is needs to be replaced on my 70 to 200. And um, so I don't know. I'm going to try. Nikon 7200 is, I, I can't remember who just crowned it as the kind of the champ of all Nikon 7200s though, but it, it is a fantastic lens. Um, it's not cheap though, is it? Um, no. <laughs> is it sitting at, sitting at 2,400 with the savings? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's crazy. I would have, I mean, I would sell my other one, of course, but yeah. I need to have my other one like refurbished or something like I just, or I'll just buy a new grip and maybe put on, but I'm really hard on it. Like I use it for every portrait session. You know, it's It would be fantastic to not have to use the ring and change everything out, but I'm there. I have no complaints about it. And actually I felt like getting a mirrorless camera like brought new life to all my lenses. And so I'm, I should, I should be patient on that, but it's tempting. <laughs> I, you know, I, I hear it, especially, you know, as a Sony shooter, uh, somebody who transitions from Canon to Sony, I used adapters for quite some time and, you know, it worked well, but it is an extra thing to remember. It's an extra thing that, you know, you're kind of hassled with uh, when you change lenses. Um, so, yeah, I, I totally see kind of wanting to leave that behind and move to all native when you're shooting in the mirrorless. Yeah. And actually, my only two uh, lenses that I would need to use the adapter for would be my 85 and my macro, which <laughs> I don't 
use my macro for a portrait session. So I would always be able to keep the adapter on the 85 and that would just make things a little bit easier. It is kind of annoying with my, I use a spider holster and the adapter just kind of, I have to like kind of shift the spider holster a little bit to get the adapter on. So it's not fun to switch back and forth. Yeah. So, yeah. But it all works fine. And so it's just about being patient and prioritizing what needs to be replaced next. Yeah, I understand. For me, um, nothing terribly exciting, uh, a new, new SSD. Um, I have a two terabyte that I absolutely love, but starting two nights ago, it started to act up on my MacBook Air. It's fine on my iMac. And I don't know if that's because one of these I've upgraded to the, what is it, Mojave, I think now, and, and the other one isn't or what, but two terabytes is, is a little tight for me for a year. I'm, I'm, it's almost full and, um, you know, there weren't too many big trips this year, but when I look at what I'm doing next year and also wanting to do a little more video as well, uh, two terabytes is, is, um, just a little too small. So I'd love to see a good discount on a four terabyte SSD. The fast ones are still pretty expensive, but I'd love to see that come down. I don't know, Nicole, do you, do you work off an SSD? Yes, I have a, just blanked on the brand. Um, but yeah, I have a two terabyte SSD. I'm going to be having to get another one as well. Yeah. Um, just, I didn't, I started out just putting everything on my laptop. I'm like, this is not smart at all because <laughs> this thing could crash and I'll lose everything. So, yeah, yeah, we get, we see a lot of that. And so I just reminded people the other day to do backups, backup, not only their photos, but backup their catalog too, mm -hmm. um, because another friend of mine, their catalog just got corrupted, which if you've done a lot of work in your catalog, it's no, it's not, you're not losing your pictures, but it's still a huge pain in the butt. So, yeah. Uh, all right, let's uh, let's answer some quick Q and A's. Uh, Ratish wants to know, and I think uh, this is for all of us, uh, but we'll start with you, Nicole. Uh, how do you store all your photos and keep them organized? Uh, he's wondering, do you use uh, Google Photos, which makes it easier to pull out any pics you need? Um, how, how do you keep all of these different food photos organized, Nicole? So I have probably kind of rudimentary system that I created. So in my in my SSD, I have three main folders. One is like personal work. One is for all the cocktails and then another folder for client work. And then within those folders are the specific projects. So if it's a cocktail, it's the name of the cocktail and all of the raws and the JPEGs that I shoot with raw plus the JPEG. So all those go into the folder. And then I have another subfolder of the ones that I'm going to edit after I've culled through them. And then usually I save them in the same folder of where I put them to be edited. And I do the same thing for personal and for client work. And then from there, I, if I'm sharing with a client, I have a, a system on my website um, where I can put their client gallery and they can log in with a password. So I just uploaded from there, but I don't use any other system. I thought about using like culling systems, but I haven't gotten there yet. Cause I just feel like I want to be the one looking at every single thing and picking it out. Like I just want to be hands-on with everything. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you talking about some of the kind of AI uh, yeah. software? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I almost, I almost added that to this show. Uh, there's a, there's a new company that just raised like 13 million, which isn't that much in the world of kind of like startups. Um, but they are aiming to be a huge player in that kind of artificial intelligence culling and editing. Actually, I think more so just editing for these guys. But I know that there's several other companies out there trying to be the ones that say, feed us your big group of images. We'll pick out the winners for you. And it does. I, I hear what you're saying. It doesn't feel like something that I would want to do. Tanya? No, I'm not interested in that at all. I feel yeah. like I'm real picky about that stuff. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's move on to the next question. Uh, Janelle says the Christmas season is coming. Are there any holiday dishes that you like to photograph? Uh, Nicole, do you have in mind any uh, holiday dishes or let's throw in cocktails too? Yeah, so we've actually been thinking a little bit ahead because um, we've been doing seasonal stuff. So we've done some Thanksgiving and like autumn, Halloween type cocktails. So mm -hmm. we were thinking about for Christmas, 
Um, Cause actually when we were shooting for the, the, the one that you had up earlier, it's the cranberry martini. Um, we mm-hmm. were thinking about putting rosemary as the garnish. I'm like, no, it'll look like Christmas if we do it because of the green and the red. So we didn't, we held off on that, but we might revisit the cranberry and rosemary again for Christmas. But we were also thinking about, um, it, it spun from, from Halloween. I saw a smoke machine. I was like, oh, we could do something with like smoke and like dry mm-hmm. ice or something. But I'm like, what if we did something that was supposed to be really cold and we used ice and smoke as the ambiance for the shoot? So maybe like January, we might do something with ice and maybe a blue cocktail or something like that. So it's cool. Probably- and you mentioned this at the beginning of the show, but when you're saying we, do you mean your husband too? Is he part uh, yeah. of this planning? Yeah, so awesome. he's, he's, uh, he's been roped in and he's an official member of the photographic team. So he's always putting on lotion on his hands because he knows they're probably going to be on camera in some way. So I love it. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah. Um, OK, good question. And um, uh, Chris wants to ask, uh, she asked the one about the aperture. Uh, Nicole, are you taking most of these food photos on a tripod? Um, I mix it up. So sometimes if I know I'm going to be compositing, then I'm definitely using a tripod just to set the scene. So like with the baklava that I just posted, I knew that I wasn't going to be sure how the honey was going to fall. So I had it on a tripod so I could get multiple little swirls of the honey from the honey dipper and composite if I need to. But if I know like ahead of time, like I'm going to get this handheld and I don't need to shoot very slow if I'm using um, artificial light, then I will handhold it and I'll get the couple shots that I need. But sometimes when I when I'm really like planning ahead of time and I know I'm going to do like a splash or, you know, like the fire one, we did like the 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 lime rind. Um, kind of lit on, lit some rum on fire like that. Like when I know I'm doing something like that, I'm like, I have to use a tripod because I want to make sure that I can fix anything and post if I need to. So everything lines up from multiple shots. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Tanya, I want to actually ask you the same question. You're, you're shooting a lot of portraits. I always think it's interesting for people to hear. How often are you using a tripod in portraiture? Almost never. Yeah. which is very different from when I'm shooting macro always. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I'm shooting like I do a lot of composites with my self portraiture, um, those are always shot on tripod. So, mm-hmm. and not just because for the same reason that Nicole said, not just because I'm taking pictures of myself, which I need a tripod for, but because I'm shooting a composite and I need everything to be in the same place. So. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. All right. Good. Uh, and just uh, we asked the chat what was on their wish list. Roy, he's got 14 terabyte drives. I think he said he's going to put those in his uh, NAS. And Pam Case is looking for a telephoto lens for her Nikon Z. Uh, B&H actually had an eight terabyte external hard drive on sale today. They did. Yep, they did. And they've had, I can't remember if they've had the, the bigger ones. Oh, in their holiday list, they have a 16 terabyte. It's one of the ones that's already, I think um, Roy is looking for naked drives, but they have 16 terabyte. Uh, for what, like 300 bucks? That's, I mean, that's just a massive amount of storage. No, it's not the fastest, uh, but if you need to back up everything you have, that one drive should do it for you. Buy two. That always makes me nervous though, because I have had hard drives fail. Like I have a hard, like an external hard drive in, I have one at home, one in my studio, and one in my school office. So I'm actually backing up in three locations to an external hard drive. But every once in a while, one will just die. And I think like there was a ton of information on it. So sometimes having that many terabytes makes me nervous because if you do lose it, you lose a lot. Whereas the smaller ones, you know, if that's your only one and you lose that, you didn't lose everything for like four years. (laughs) So it's always a balancing act because so let's say you get a couple smaller ones juggling what's on each of those and making sure that they're backed up versus one big one uh as long as it's backed i'm okay with the big and it's kind of that that same question of we get on trips like should i shoot on 64 gigabyte card or 128 gigabyte card and i say as long as you're backing up it's okay but that is that's a lot of space so 
Roy's pointing out that in his NAS, um, these these multiple drives are being mirrored. So it's kind of it's a RAID system. So it backup is built into it, which is it's very nice. It's very nice. It's kind of the best of both worlds. All right, uh, we've got through all of the Q and A's, uh, and that wraps the show up. So, Nicole, thank you so much for being on today. You are a fantastic guest. Love your work. Looking forward to following you uh, more on Instagram. And um, if you're watching this and you haven't already clicked over to Instagram and click follow, uh, Nicole's link is right down below this video and it's on the screen right now. Stay in focus images on Instagram. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm going to try and replicate what you did and go viral. (laughs) (laughs) By all the knowledge that I've learned today. I think you should just post something that feels completely ridiculous and then we'll do it. That's what I did. <laughs> and post some fun music uh, and pick, pick, pick the right music track. Yeah. Yeah. That's important too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, our, our viral TikToker is Tanya Wilhelm and you can follow her at tanyawilhelm.artist. Uh, from there, she's got lots more Instagrams. She keeps them all kind of separate and nice, neat and tidy like, like her life like her Christmas decorations, it's all pretty neat and tidy. Um, And so go follow those because you are creating a lot of really interesting work across those Instagrams. And I just, I love just seeing the different work. Some really, really nice senior portraitures over the last couple of days. Thank Uh, you. Lovely light, lovely, lovely light. Fall is, because I'm in Pennsylvania, Nicole. So we're we're both, I know as soon as I leave the studio, it's gonna be like nighttime outside. Um, But man, fall sessions are so beautiful. So, yeah, yeah. All right. And chat room, thanks so much for hanging out with us. Roy, thanks for staying in the background and managing all that you did. I really appreciate that. If you're watching this and you're not a pen member, of course, photorec.tv slash pen. And if you're watching this and you haven't already, a thumbs up is just a really nice, easy way to thank us for our time. Uh, we'll be off next week because it's really close to holidays and my house will be full of people. Um, but we'll be back the week after to chat about the week's photo news and kind of the year end wrap up. Uh, If you've been following this channel for a while, you know that I do my annual slideshow. So you all watching need to start thinking about what is your one favorite image that you created this year. So you could submit that for the year end slideshow, which we've been doing now for, I think like eight years in a row. Maybe I just made it more than, I think it has been close to that. It's just a really cool thing. Um, to do and be part of. So you don't have to be a pen member if you're watching this. It's just anybody who watches this channel is allowed to submit an image for that. So stay tuned for more information about that. All right, everybody. Till next time. Bye-bye.